Okay, uh, let's continue with our uh, discussion of uh, quantum mechanics. We're halfway through. We've done three slides. Uh, so, so what we were discussing there was that <clears throat> if we take a particle in a box, a uh, one-dimensional box, uh, then using either the de Broglie relationship uh, or using the Schrodinger equation, we can easily generate uh, uh, wave functions, and associated with those wave functions are energy levels, and the uh, energy levels are defined by a string of constants and uh, a quantum number, which can go between one and infinity. <coughs> and this, if we, if we go, if we take this model and move into three dimensions, then this is the model that we use for translational motion. So this describes how molecules move through space. So what about vibration? So molecules vibrate. Let's have a look at a diatomic molecule and uh, what do its vibrational energy levels look like? Well, first of all, we have to define the potential energy that we're going to put into the Schrodinger equation. And uh, so this is a model of a simple harmonic oscillator. So the displacement, uh, the, the, the restoring force depends upon the square of the displacement. Uh, or depends on the displacement of the potential energy depends upon the square of the displacement. Uh, so that's the shape of the potential energy function. It's a little bit more complicated to solve, and the wave functions are no longer simple sine functions, they're Gaussian functions. And uh, one important thing is that they penetrate through this potential energy barrier. If you look at this region here, then the total energy is less than the kinetic energy. Sorry. The total energy is less than the potential energy, and which means that the, the kinetic energy must be negative. An interesting concept. Um, so, so we've got these Gaussian functions. Again, the wavelength decreases as we go up in energy, uh, and uh, the energy levels are now given by uh, a quantum number uh, n, uh, which goes from 1, uh, up, again, up to infinity. And these are the energies relative to the bottom of the uh, potential well here. And you see that, once again, we've got zero-point energy. So zero-point energy is, is naturally defined by the solution of the Schrodinger equation. Um, and these energy levels are now equally spaced and the quantum numbers correspond to 1, 2, 3, 4, et cetera. And we'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, but a, a key issue is that the wave function can penetrate into what's called this non-classical region. And this is called quantum mechanical tunneling. And in this region, the wave function is no longer oscillatory. It's oscillatory inside but outside, it decays roughly exponentially, not quite exponentially, uh, as uh, the system moves towards infinity. So this is a hot, what's called a harmonic oscillator. And it's an important uh, model that we use extensively to describe vibrations in molecules. Let's have a think about the quantization of different sorts of energy. Uh, so electronic energy levels refer to the motion of the electrons in the molecule. So, so we have a molecule, uh, say a diatomic molecule, which has got, we've got electrons, and these electrons are moving around. And we can uh, have different energy levels associated with, uh, with these electrons. <coughs> <coughs> and we can determine these energy level spacings experimentally, or we can calculate them using quantum mechanics. And those energy levels are usually very widely spaced. Uh, the vibrational energy levels are the next most widely spaced, and there's a stack of vibrational energy levels associated with each electronic energy level. 
Uh, of course, vibrational energy levels are only going to occur in molecules. They won't occur in atoms. And then, whoops. Uh, then we have uh, rotational energy levels, which are even more closely spaced together. Uh, uh, and each vibrational energy level has a set of rotational energy levels. And then finally, the molecules can move through space, and we have translational energy levels associated with them. And as we'll see, and I'll say a little bit more about this later on, the important, uh, one of the important quantities is the spacing of these energy levels compared with uh, um, the thermal energy, uh, compared with, with RT for a, a molar system, or compared with, as we'll see, KT for a molecular system. Okay, now, <coughs> one of the really interesting things that comes out of quantum mechanics and comes out of it quite naturally is the process of quantum mechanical tunneling. And let's illustrate this with respect to this. There's the potential energy. It's a step. And there's the total energy. And so the potential energy is constant over here, and it's constant over there, but it's greater than E here, and it's less than E here. So Here's the Schrodinger equation, slightly rearranged. Let's solve it. E minus V is a constant. Let's first of all look over here. Uh, let's try a solution A is equal to A e to the minus e, A exponential of ikx. And K we can get from the solution of the Schrodinger equation, and it's going to come out like that. 8 pi squared m E minus V times H squared. E is greater than V. And so the solution is oscillatory. We can represent this as a sum of, sum of sine and cosine functions. Uh, and this is exactly as we discussed for a particle in a box. Or, well, not quite exactly, but it's related to it. Now, what's going to happen over here? Well, over here we've got V greater than E. And so this quantity in here is, is now negative. And we can't get its square root, except as an imaginary number. And so let's define a quantity kappa, which is eight, which, in which we reverse this. And so kappa is equal to i times k. And so we've got i times k times i. So we've got psi is equal to b times the exponential of minus kappa x. And so we've got an, an exponentially decaying function. So over here, we've got an oscillatory function. Over here, we've got an exponentially decaying function. But remember that psi squared is the probability density for the particle. And so what this is saying is that this particle can get out into this region here where it's got negative kinetic energy. It can get into this non-classical region. And from a... A kinetic point of view, what it means is that we said if we've got a reaction where this is the activation energy, that's the transition state up the top, uh, you'd expect we had to go over the top in order to react. But this is telling us that in principle, it's possible to go through the barrier, to quantum mechanically tunnel through that barrier and uh, react with lower energy than would otherwise be the case. And we'll see examples of that later on. And an important thing is the dependence on mass. So uh, this function decays in a way that depends upon the square root of the mass. So a hydrogen atom is going to decay with uh, a smaller, with it, the, the, the wave function for a hydrogen atom is going to decay more slowly going through this barrier than would be the case for a heavier atom. So quantum mechanical tunneling in chemical kinetics, is, and it's in combustion in particular, is primarily involved in, with hydrogen atoms, with the transfer of hydrogen atoms.
OK. Uh, that's, that's all we're going to say about uh, quantum mechanics, at least for today. Um, and uh, the important things to bear in mind are that out of quantum mechanics naturally comes quantized energy levels. Uh, and the spacings of, of those energy levels is going to depend upon the type of energy we're dealing with. Um, in addition, out of that solution of the Schrodinger equation comes the wave function. And the wave function is, is a key attribute in determining uh, all sorts of things, such as uh, uh, rate constants for reactions. Uh, and then finally, this issue of quantum mechanical tunneling, which arises because of this decay of the wave function into the non-classical region, uh, allowing uh, systems to penetrate through energy barriers. OK, uh, now let's have a look at statistical mechanics. Um, so statistical mechanics is the determination of macroscopic properties, thermodynamic but also kinetic, uh, from microscopic properties of the component molecules. So um, the, uh, the spacings of the energy levels of the molecules is important in determining their thermodynamic quantities, uh, and STATMEC allows us to calculate those properties. It relies heavily on a description of the energy levels of the molecules and the distribution of the molecules throughout these energy levels, and we'll see how, how that can be determined. We'll examine thermodynamic properties of what are called canonical ensembles. Uh, so these are ensembles of molecules in which we've got a constant number of molecules, a constant temperature, and a constant volume. Uh, I'll explain later on why the constant volume is important. Um, we also will deal with what are called microcanonical microcanonical systems, microcanonical ensembles. And here we're dealing with systems of constant energy and constant volume. So this, would, this is particularly important when we're dealing with molecular systems. We might want to know what's happening at particular energy in this molecular system. We'll base our discussion on the most probable distribution of molecules throughout the energy levels. Um, These molecule, the molecules can be distributed throughout these energy levels in any way we want, or any way they want, provided that we conserve the total number of molecules, the total energy, uh, and we have a constant volume. So, so uh, sorry, the total energy is defined by the temperature. So, so the total energy of the system is defined by the temperature. But one of the important things is that we have an enormous number of molecules. We're dealing with a huge, huge number of molecules. And this has consequences in terms of, uh, of, of the most probable distribution. And that most probable distribution is by far and away more probable than any others. Uh, so, so because of the large numbers of molecules, there is, there is this key aspect of them that this most probable distribution is the one that's important. Uh, so, and we get this, this uh, most probable distribution by maximizing the entropy. Um, uh, the most probable direction of, of, of a system moving is towards maximizing its entropy, as we discussed before. Sp and this allows, this involves spreading the molecules as widely as possible throughout the energy levels. If we had a set of energy levels and we simply put all the molecules in the lowest energy level, there's only one way of doing that. That's by putting all the molecules in the lowest energy level. But if we spread them out, we can do that in lots and lots of different ways by moving those molecules around. Uh, and so uh, maximizing them is going to spread them out as much as we can, provided we keep uh, it's, co it's compatible with the constant temperature. OK, so this is uh, Ludwig Boltzmann. Uh, this is his uh, 
um, monument in Vienna, uh, and, and he was a truly great man. He, people, unfortunately, didn't realize just how good he was at the time, but uh, what he has done is, 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 has been phenomenally important in, in, in our subject. Um, and what he says is that molecules are arranged throughout the energy levels subject to a constant total number. That's how we define the canonical ensemble. And a constant total, ener total energy E, this was the energy of a particular molecular, particular set of molecules here. This is the energy of the total system. Uh, <coughs> and N is very, very large of the order of 10 to the 23. And the most probable distribution, subject to the above description, dominates. Dominates, dominates, dominates. And <coughs> if W is the weight of this configuration, um, we said that if we put all the molecules in the lowest energy level, there's only one way of doing that, then that corresponds to W is equal to 1. If we spread them out, then W increases. And we spread them out in such a way that we maximize W. Uh, and so, so the entropy is found from this equation here, K is e S is equal to K log W by maximizing, the, the, maximizing W. And if you go and look on Boltzmann's monument, then there you find S is equal to K log W. Uh, what a wonderful monument to have. Um, okay, so out of this, we get this most probable distribution, which is the, called the Boltzmann distribution. And it's, what it says is that the number of molecules in an energy level I divided by N, the total number of molecules, is equal to GI, I'll explain what that is in a minute, times e to the minus beta ei over q, where beta is 1 over kt. So this is the energy of the level divided by kt. And k is Boltzmann's constant. And uh, you can relate. I, I do apologize that we will use uh, k for a rate constant and k for Boltzmann constant, but it should be obvious which is which. Uh, but... Uh, K is the Boltzmann constant, and if you multiply this by the Avogadro number, so multiply K by the Avogadro number, then that's equal to the gas constant R. So that's the relationship between uh, microsystems and macrosystems. Okay, so Ni is the total number of molecules in the ith energy level. N is the total number overall. GI is called the degeneracy, and the de degeneracy is the number of states at that particular energy. And we'll, I'll give you examples of this later on. So we have a particular energy, but there may be more than one state at that energy, and we call the number of states the degeneracy, G. And at the bottom of this, we've got something called the partition function. And the partition function is defined in this way. It's a sum over all the levels of gi times e to the minus beta ei. So if you like, that's simply taking this expression here, summing it over all the energy levels. This will become n over n, and that will become the sum over this lot, q over q. So, so the partition function is simply the <coughs> sum of this quantity here over all the energy levels, i. So it's a sum over all the energy levels, weighted according to the probability of their occupation. Uh, now, what does that mean? Let's, let's have a look at that. So, let's take a harmonic oscillator. Uh, we'll we've got evenly spaced levels, and we'll make the spacings of the levels E. And this is what the population distribution will look like at different temperatures. So if we go to low energy levels, such that uh, the energy multiplied by beta is equal to 3, then this quantity is going to be very small as we go up in energy. So E is the spacings of the energy levels. So if we go to multiple values of E, then this is going to fall off very rapidly, and the molecules are going to be mainly down in these lower energy levels. And that's the most probable distribution. If we then increase <coughs> beta E, this is basically increasing the temperature. 
Remember, beta is proportional to 1 over the temperature. So we're increasing the temperature. And what we're doing is we're, this is now decreasing more slowly, and we're spreading the molecules out more and more and more. And so as we go up in temperature, we spread the molecules out more and more and more throughout the energy levels. And as a consequence of this, the partition function, which is the sum over all these energy levels, uh, weighted according to the probability of their occupation, is going to increase. It's not much more than one here. If all the molecules are in the lowest energy level, then Q would be one. Uh, and as we go up, then this partition function increases. So let's have a look at, at energy levels for different sorts of, of motion. And uh, let's remember, and we've got Planck's constant first of all, uh, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34. Uh, we often define a quantity called h cross, which is h over 2 pi times c, where c is the speed of light. Uh, so c is the speed of light. And then this quantity here, kt over hc, is 207 wave numbers. Uh, now, um, why, why wave numbers? Um, if, if you look at, at spec if, you, if you study spectroscopy, then what you find is that we often use the symbol centimeters to the minus one to uh, describe uh, molecular quantities, uh, um, a rotational constant or a vibrational, uh, uh, a vibrational number. Um, and uh, this is in, 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 in units of centimeters to the minus one, and it's basically a frequency, proportional to a frequency divided by the speed of sound, uh, speed of light, sorry. Um, and so it's going to finish up. So this has got units of seconds to the minus one. This has got units of uh, meters per second. We can convert that into centimeters per second. And this uh, frequency, converted frequency, has got units of centimeters to the minus one. And <laughs> it's a bit of a fuss, but it's very, very, very widely used in spectroscopy. And so uh, if you're getting information from... Um, uh, ab initio calculations, uh, then often frequencies will be quoted in centimeters to the minus one. Uh, if we look at, um, let's have a look at, explain what this KT, where this KT over HC comes from. Supposing what we've got is two vibrational levels. This has got an energy of H nu, the first vibrational energy level. And the pop its population is going to be the exponent is going to be proportional to the exponential of minus the energy divided multiplied by beta, in other words, divided by kT. Now let's convert that frequency into um, uh, omega quantity omega. Omega is equal to the frequency nu divided by c. So nu is equal to omega times c. So this is now going to be equal to h times omega times c over kt. And so this is why this quantity kt over hc is so important, because it's the, it's the um, quantity we're comparing this uh, omega value with. So kT over hc is an important quantity. And uh, at 300k, 298k, it's equal to 207.2 reciprocal centimeters. Uh, that's one of the, no I, I remember very few numbers. That's one of the few numbers that I remember. I've had a hard life. It's, uh... So, Let's go to translational motion. What we're going to do is look at different energy levels. Go to translational motion. Uh, particle, mass m in a cubic box, side a, quantum numbers nx, ny, and z. 
the spacing is very, very much less than kT. Or, uh, or, uh, or in wave number units, it's very, very much less than kT over hc. And this is the expression for the energy levels. Uh, it depends upon Planck's constant, the mass of the particle, the size of the box, and the quantum numbers nx, ny, nz, which can take the values 1, 2, 3, etc. If we go to rotation, if we have a, a diatomic molecule or a linear molecule, it can rotate on its axis. And it has a set of energy levels uh, which depend upon the moment of inertia, I, and a quantum number, J. The spacing is now less than kT, not a lot less than kT, uh, and at very low temperatures, it's not less than kT. But under combustion conditions, it's generally less than kT. And the energy levels now are given by this quantum number j, j into j plus 1 times h squared over 8 pi squared i. i is the moment of inertia. The bigger the moment of inertia, the more closely spaced the molecules are. Uh, and uh, we often express that in terms of a quantity b, which comes directly from spectroscopy. It's the spacing of lines and the rotational spectrum of a molecule. Uh, and h b is equal to h over 8 pi squared i c. So we can just, where, where b is in reciprocal centimeter units. Uh, and so we can substitute in this for this quantity b. And then vibration with a diatomic molecule, the vibrational, vibrational frequency nu, quantum number is v, and k, another k, is the force constant, and mu is the reduced mass. So the reduced mass we define in the following way. If we've got a diatomic molecule AB, then the reduced mass mu is equal to the mass of A times the mass of B divided by the mass of A plus the mass of B. So that's the reduced mass. And uh, the frequency depends upon the force constant, the strength of the bond, and, uh, and that determines the restoring force, uh, and the reduced mass, mu. And mu is equal to omega times c, as we've said before. And v is this uh, uh, quadratic uh, this parabola term here, which we looked at before. Okay, um, roughly half an hour. Any, any questions on all of that? <coughs> Are you all punch drunk? This is all relevant. Believe me. <laughs> okay, that's great. You've understood absolutely everything that I've said. So. <laughs> um, if um, if you if you wake up in the middle of the night wondering about something, uh, then you know do please raise it tomorrow, and we'll we'll all discuss it together. Okay, so there we've got translational motion, and that where the levels are very, very closely spaced. We can treat translational motion really as, as classical motion. Uh, the levels are so very, very closely spaced. Uh, we've got rotational motion, vibrational motion, and now let's turn to oh, uh, a little bit of additional information. B and omega of units of reciprocal centimeters determined spectroscopically, and the degeneracy, I talked about degeneracy early on, the degeneracy of each of these levels is 2j plus 1. And the origin of that is that the angular momentum is a vector, uh, and that vector can point in various different directions, uh, but those different directions are quantized. It can't point in any old direction. The directions are quantized, and there are 2j plus 1 of them going from plus j in this direction to minus j in that direction. In the absence of an external field, 
all of those energy levels have got this, all of those uh, different J values have got the same energy. Different orientations have got the same energy. And these refer specifically to diatomic molecules, but equivalent expressions exist for uh, polyatomic molecules with many vibrations and uh, up to three rotations. Okay, um, let's say a little bit about um, electronic energy. Um, what I said was the electronic energy levels are very widely spaced. And for most of the systems we deal with, the molecules are all sitting in the lowest energy level. And by and large, we don't have to worry too much about electronic energy. But there are some issues that we need to understand because they do crop up in combustion. Um, so uh, the electronic states of atoms are determined by their ter what are called term symbols. And uh, the oxygen atom has got three low-lying states. And they're given the symbols triplet P2, triplet P1, triplet P0. How many of you have come across this? Okay. The chemists, I presume. No. <laughs> so some of you have come across this, this notation. Uh, and, I mean, an oxygen atom is, is important in, in combustion. And so this, these considerations are significant. Uh, <clears throat> so let's explain what these things mean and uh, what their significance is. So, so these are the energy levels of uh, the oxygen atom, triplet P2, triplet P1, triplet P0, and they've got energies of 158 wave numbers and 227 wave numbers. And those correspond to 1.89 and 2.72 kilojoules per mole, quite low energies. Uh, especially at combustion temperatures. Okay, the superscript three refers to what's called the multiplicity, which is 2s plus 1. I'll explain what that means, in, means now. Um, we're dealing with an oxygen atom. And um, we need to look at what's called the electronic configuration. Which is where the electrons are sitting. And they sit in atomic orbitals. And these, the first is, a, is an S orbital, which is spherically symmetric. And there are two electrons in there. The next is a 2S orbital, again spherically symmetric two electrons in there, and then we have a p orbital, which are directional. Uh, and there are four electrons in there. And the total number we could put in there is six. So if you like, there are two holes in, this, in these p orbitals. And we can treat those holes rather like electrons. So let's just think of this basically as being two electrons. Or actually four, but we'll think of it as being two. And each of these electrons has got a spin, and that spin is equal to a half. And that spin, in this particular state, those spins are aligned so that the overall spin, capital S, is equal to a half plus a half, which is one. So um, this triplet state means that there are two electrons in there, or the equivalent of two electrons in there, and their spins are parallel. <clears throat> so that explains these triplets here. <coughs> and the P refers to the orbital angular momentum. <coughs> an electron in a P orbital has got an orbital angular momentum of one. An electron in an S orbital has got an orbital angular momentum of zero. So we're dealing with four P electrons, or two holes, if you like, each of which has got uh, 
<coughs> an angular momentum of one. Now, they interact in a fairly complicated way, and we simply don't have time to go through that. But the net result of this is that the lowest energy states in the oxygen atom have got an overall ang orbital angular momentum of one. So the overall orbital angular momentum is given the symbol L, and that's equal to one. So this is the total orbital <coughs> angular momentum, L, which is equal to one. And for L is equal to one, we give it a symbol capital P. So that capital P there means that the overall orbital angular momentum is one. And then finally, we've got these subscripts here, which refer to J, which is the total angular momentum, which is the sum of L plus S. Okay, so we've got uh, S is equal to one, L is equal to one, so if they align with one another, then J is equal to two. If one of them is perpendicular to the other, then L J is equal to one, and if they uh, are aligned in the opposite direction, then J is equal to zero. So that explains why we get the J is equal to naught, one, and two. So P describes the electronic orbital angular momentum, L and S states have L is equal to S states of L is equal to zero, P states L is equal to one, D states L is equal to two. And then the subscript refers to the total angular momentum J formed from the quantized vector sum of L and S. Other atoms, we've got uh, hydrogen is doublet S a half, carbon is much the same as, as oxygen, but inverted. Nitrogen is a quartet S, sulfur is a triplet P just like oxygen. Now, one of, the, one of the key issues here is the degeneracy of these levels. So we've got uh, three levels. We've got triplet P0, triplet P1, triplet P2, and the degeneracy, G, is equal to 2J plus 1. Much the same as we had before, we've got a... a uh, an angular momentum vector which can point in various directions and there are 2j plus 1 of those directions. And so these have got degeneracies of 1, of 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3, and of 5. And remember that the populations of the levels ni over n are proportional to the degeneracy times e to the minus EI over KT. So the populations of the levels are going to depend not only on their energy, but also on the degeneracy. Diatomic molecules. Uh, diatomic <coughs> molecules are described in a similar way. Uh, most are in what are called singlet sigma ground states. Uh, you Unfortunately, um, when you read a lot of this, uh, this theoretical chemistry, you come across all these, all these term symbols. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to give you some background as to what they all mean. Uh, the superscript, once again, is 2s plus 1, where s is the spin. And so if it's a singlet ground state, then it means the spin is zero. All the spins are, 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 are aligned. Um, sigma refers to the orbital angular momentum along the internuclear axis. And sigma means that it's zero. If we had a, a, a pi state here, that would mean that the orbital angle, that would mean that lambda was equal to one. Both OH and NO, which are important in, co in combustion, have what are called doublet pi ground states. This means that the 2s plus one is equal to two, which means that the spin is equal to a half. And the pi means that lambda, the angular momentum along the internuclear axis, is equal to 1. Oops. <coughs> so 
uh, we now need to consider the total angular momentum, which is the sum of the spin along the internuclear axis and the, uh, uh, the orbital angular momentum. And this spin can either align with the one or against the one, so we'll get overall angular momentum of 3 over 2 and 1 over 2. Um, these are necessarily constrained to lie along the internuclear axis. So they can't take two omega plus one orientations. They can only take a plus orientation or a minus orientation. So the degeneracy of each of them is two. The former is the ground, the omega is three over two is the ground state and half lies higher by 139.2 wave numbers for OH. 121.1 for NO. So let's have a look at what that means. <coughs> it means that for these important species, we've got two energy levels which are separated by not a lot of energy. And the, they, both of them have degeneracies of two. And the separation of energy is delta E, which varies from one to the other. Okay, and uh, um, you'll be pleased to know that uh, uh, I think that you're not really being worked hard enough on this course. <laughs> uh, so I've got a little problem for you tonight to... Uh, Solve, which is related to this, and which I'll give you out later on. You won't really understand what it's about yet. But, uh, are you surviving <laughs> after, after not quite a whole day? I think six hours of lectures in a day is, uh, is pretty tough. But you're all up to it, I'm sure. Aren't you? Okay, polyatomic molecules. Um, just let me give you one example which is important in combustion, and that's methylene. So most molecules have singlet ground states uh, so that uh, 2s plus 1 is equal to 1, which means that the spin is equal to 0. There's no net spin. Radicals such as CH3 have an odd electron, and so their spin is equal to a half. So that's important to remember in terms of degeneracies. Uh, methylene is a biradical, and which means it's got two electrons. And we need to consider uh, what happens with those two electrons. And the spins of those electrons can be parallel, which means that S is equal to 1. and 2s plus 1 is equal to 3. So that's a triplet state. And we usually call that triplet methylene. In this one, the spins are antiparallel. And so this has got spin of a 0. So 2s plus 1 is equal to 1. And so this is singlet methylene. And the two are separated by an energy, is it up there? Yeah, 37.6 kilojoules per mole. So at room temperature, most of them are going to be, or, or can be deactivated down to the ground state. But as you go up in temperature, then the population of the, of the singlet state increases. And this is much more reactive. So the triplet ground state is comparatively unreactive. The rate constants for its reactions, apart from with oxygen, are quite small. Uh, but, the, but the singlet is really much more reactive. Uh, so singlet and triplet methylene. OK, we've mentioned partition functions. So let's have a look at partition functions 
for the various types of motion. Uh, so, the, so there's the general definition of a partition function, the sum over all the levels of the degeneracy multiplied by e to the minus beta ei, or minus ei over kt. Um, and here's a translational partition function. Remember, uh, uh, so m is the mass, v is the volume. And the translational partition functions depend upon the total volume. And they depend upon the total volume because, as you remember, when we solved the Schrodinger equation for a particle in a box, the size of the box was important. So in one dimension, the size of the box, A, was important in determining the spacings of the energy levels. So when we go to three dimensions, it's the volume of the box that's important. And so the spacings of the energy levels, and therefore the partition function, depend upon the volume. Uh, now, we will use uh, a sort of modified partition function, Q, uh, especially when we're talking about transition state theory, which is basically the partition function divided by the volume, so we've taken this volume term out of it. Rotational partition functions, Q rotational is KT over sigma HBC. B, as I mentioned before, is the rotational constant, which we get from spectroscopy, and it's proportional to 1 over the moment of inertia. Uh, and it's got units of centimeters to the minus 1. That's why this C is in there. Sigma is what's called a symmetry number. And uh, it differs, for example, between hydrogen and HCl. Uh, if you think of rotating hydrogen, then you can rotate it through 180 degrees, and that new molecule is indistinguishable from the old molecule. And uh, so the net result of this is that the number of allowed energy levels goes down by a factor of two. And that's allowed for by putting a symmetry number, sigma is equal to two, um, in the partition function. So this is reducing the partition function by a factor of two. If we do the same thing for HCl, then when you rotate it by 180 degrees, then you can distinguish those two different situations. So in this case, sigma is equal to one. And for polyatomic molecules, you get uh, a whole range of different types of symmetry numbers depending upon the symmetry of the molecule. So, for example, for CH3, which is a planar uh, radical with the uh, symmetrically placed hydrogen atoms, the symmetry number is 6. So, you can work it out by looking at all the possible equivalent orientations of that molecule. Uh, this is the expression for uh, uh, a polyatomic molecule where A, B, and C refer to the three moments of inertia of the molecule. So Ix, Iy, Iz are related inversely to those rotational constants, A, B, and C. Q vibration um, uh, is Hc omega over Kt for a linear molecule, for, sorry, for a diatomic molecule, and for a polyatomic molecule, then it's the same expression, uh, the product of the same expression over all the different vibrations that you have. And these vibrational partition functions, uh, as I've written them, refer to the zero-point energy. And that's the most useful form of expression for us in, in chemical kinetics. Um, If you, think about the, um, supposing what we've got is we've got uh, a molecule with n atoms. 
then if we think of these atoms independently, then we're going to have three n coordinates that will describe them. So they can move independently in x, y, and z direction. If we think of the molecule as a whole, then three of those will be taken up with translation. so that the molecule can move in x, y, and z directions. Two of them will be associated with rotation for a linear molecule, because we only have two moments of inertia. And three for rotation for a nonlinear. And this means we're going to have 3n minus 5 or 3n minus 6 vibrations, depending upon whether the molecule is linear or nonlinear. So that's an easy way of working out how many vibrations you have for these different molecules. Degeneracy, I've mentioned this several times, uh, is the number of states distinguishable states at a given energy EI. For a rotational energy level J, the degeneracy is 2J plus 1. For an atom, the degeneracy is also 2J plus 1, uh, so that we have these degeneracies 5, 3, and 1 for oxygen. Uh, for the lowest state of H, double P, a half, I'm afraid I got the half as a superscript in your notes. It should be a subscript. Uh, that degeneracy is 2. The diatomic molecules, the degeneracy depends upon omega. And note that, as we'll see later, we need to include these electronic degeneracies in calculations of entropies, equilibrium constants, and also in transition state theory calculations. OK, um, we haven't quite finished the statistical mechanics, um, but the next two slides will take a little while. So uh, I think, yeah, quarter past four is when you're due for a break, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> said very vigorously. <laughs> uh, OK, uh, let's, let's break for a quarter of an hour, and uh, uh, thanks for, for listening. <laughs>